I'm very pleased to be part of this. I, uh, I ran a book club for uh, Women on Tap last year. And uh, when I saw Rachel kind of prepping for, for the festival, I did like basically, I, I live in Leeds now, I kind of came over to Harrogate just to go, hey, don't forget me, I'll be doing something. <laughs> Um, so today uh, we're going to have readings uh, from Jill Lambert, from, from Lorna and from Helen Shea, who is still one of the organisers of uh, Poems, Bros and Pints, um, uh, and me, hello. Yeah, yeah, and with <laughs> Tim Ellis who's supposed to be joining, so maybe yeah. it's <laughs> Yeah, no, my, uh, my other half's supposed to be joining and I can't see him, but you know, maybe <laughs> that's good, maybe I won't get embarrassed. Um, so kind of, uh, to start off with, uh, we're going to have Jill. Um, who yeah is going to read some of her work for us so take it away jill okay thanks jem i'm, I'm coming on first because i'm teaching at half two so um so if i go that's why um so i'm going to read a couple of um poems from my collection um Tadima, which is published by yaffle it was published last year and then I'm going to read a couple from a Yaffle anthology, Real Bradford. So this first one I'm going to read is about um, the day I imagine my grandma found out, found out that her husband wasn't coming back. My, my granddad, my real granddad was 26 when he was killed in the, um, in the Second World War. And my mum never met him. She was only nine months when he died. Um, so this is about that, that imagined day. Um, the, the actual truth of what happened is that um, there was only one phone in the village and um, the call came through to the pub where the phone was and the landlord had to come and tell my grandma the bad news. So this is called Washing Day. Perhaps she's wearing blue with flowers, tiny printed forget-me-nots on her apron, the ties crossed at the back, knotted under her bosom. Her hair is in a shiny roll off her face, her lips bright pink, her sleeves pushed pushed up from hand-washing woolens in the sink. I see her with a baby on her hip, woken from its nap by the doorbell. It could be a boy with a telegram who wakes the child, or a neighbour with a message from the post office, nosy, pushing past into the hall, her eyes roaming over the clutter, taking in the damp washing, the steaming pan of potatoes, and the baby jiggling, lulled to sobbing. Maybe it's just the postman with nothing more sinister than Bill's. It can't be the postman though, too late in the day. A telegram then, the boy embarrassed, needing a signature, knowing the news he's giving this woman will change her life forever. The baby, shushed to silence, now widens her eyes at the stranger. The potatoes boil over, the hand knits drip onto the lino under the mangle. If it was summer, a child's voice calls from the field, past the yard and over the lane, strung with washing lines, their sheets flapping. The child's pigtails bob above the tall grass and the dandelion clocks disturbed by a running float after her. A little girl pulled home by the sound of her mother's scream. It could be the silence calls the child from her game. The baby, her head on her mother's chest, is quiet at last, sensing the shift in the day. The woman too shocked at the words on the paper to cry. The silence in a house that is never silent. The pool below the wet washing grows and the potatoes boil dry. Thank you. <laughs> um, and this this second one from my collection um, is is a, is called repatriate. It's a word I really don't like very much because it sort of conjures up words uh, thoughts of um, men and women coming back from a war zone. Um, and sort of eased into, into normal life when actually what happens is they're coming home to be buried and cremated. Um, my son, my stepson um, is in the army and so it's kind of based on him, but you know, he's, he's still with us. So this poem's called Repatriate. Send an uneven fringe, a lopsided smile, the fall against the corner of a cupboard door when he was five, the Panini football sticker book he'd filled but for Roy Keane, the cardigan his mum nicked that he left on the school field. Send his stash of matchbox cars, his temperature of 39 degrees with measles and his chicken pox scars. His Spanish GCSE, his paper round, the scarfy water, the football ground that might have been the one he'd go to home games with his son. Belly laugh, you had to be there nights, just his oldest friends would get. The searing burn of his first and only cigarette. 
semitonsillitis, nine years out of 12, the photo of the Spice Girls he kept underneath a book on his top shelf. His rally racing bike, his fishing gear, his pulling pants, his broken nose, the fear he'd had that he'd grow old before he saw the places in the world he'd never seen, the sick soaked sheets from his first sesh at 17. Send his favorite episode of Friends, the one where Joey speaks French, his knowing every line of Blues Brothers, the recurring dream of snogging his best mate's mother. Sunday morning swimming lessons at the baths, every strange shape Christmas Eve he ever had. Kiss, catch, pecks, true romance, first wank, first sex and one night stands. Send to the diamond ring he'd give his girlfriend and I'll take the life she thought she'd live. I'll take these things, his biggest losses, his most exultant wins. I'll take his vulnerability, his grief, the times of unflinching self-belief. His lucky undies, his most gruesome socks. Send me all these things, I'll place them carefully in a box. Then I'll wrap it in the Union Jack and I'll send it back. Thank you. Um, so the next two, my last two poems that I'm going to read are two from, from Real Bradford that, um, that Lorna and I um, both had a lot to do with last year, um, where we wrote poems based on films that were filmed in and around Bradford. Um, and it just so happens that a couple of, of my poems in this book um, have war as a bit of a theme. Um, the first one I'm going to read is based, is from the, um, the film about the Cottingley fairies, fairy tale. And um, in, in this poem, I imagine the, um, the father to, to be away at war and, um, and the mother has lost a, a, a child um, as well. So there's just the two of them, her and her daughter at home, and it's called Ghosts and Fairies. She waits for the post, though she knows it won't come. She's heard all she's going to. Waits with a mouthful of pins, letting down the hem on my white pinafore. I want to tell her, spit them out, mother. But I am barefoot and careful, standing perfectly still. Your name is a nail, washed down with beck silt, and the weeds take root. It will not be spoken. I swallow it, walk on tiptoes so she thinks I've grown. My sorrow is a game made from paper, tucked into crannies in loose brickwork. And I know you belonged here once, born on a black night halfway through the year, summer a dull quiet. You stayed till the winter and war was a whisper. Fathers and brothers are ghosts and fairies. Mothers and daughters stay silent and weeds tangle inside me. I don't know anymore which is real. I can't say your name. It may as well be the king of the fairies. So I cut paper, fold it, hide it in roof tiles long after the last flame. Ghosts and fairies are one and the same. I can't tell anymore. Thank you. And, um, and my final poem is, um, is based on the film Yanks, which was filmed at Keithley Station. A lot of it was filmed at Keithley Station, um, which is really near where I live. Um, and where I've always lived really most of my life. Um, and so in, there's a, um, a, a scene where um, the girl in the film is saying goodbye to her, um, her lover, who's played by Richard Gere. And um, just um, sort of a few years after that film came out, I was saying goodbye to um, my boyfriend who was in the army. Um, but he said goodbye to me and never came back. Well, he didn't, never came back into my life anyway. So this, this poem's called Not Richard Gear. I'm wearing a dress my mother has made me from a bolt of material off the top shelf in a shop in Haworth. It is polka dot. My hair is swept off my face in a roll, my lips stained with a cherry pink lipstick I've borrowed from my sister. I am 19. Keithley Station is crowded, loud with goodbyes. I'm trying not to cry. It is 1944. You are Richard Gere and I love you. You are not Richard Gere. It is 1984. I'm 17 wearing jeans. Keithley Station is silent as ceasefire. It is 1984. You have a useless excuse. I'm watching you get on the train. I love you. I won't see you again. You are Richard Gere. The train is moving out of the station. I am waving from the footbridge. I am 19. 
I'm wearing jeans, you are Richard Gere. It is 1944 and I love you. I'm 17, I'm waving, I'm wearing a polka dot dress. It is 1984, I'm 19, I love you. You are not Richard Gere. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much, Jill. That was- Thank you. Um, yeah, much, much uh, really. So Jill's gonna pop off so I don't feel like- oh, I can stay for a little while longer, I'll stay for another 10 minutes, so that's right. fine, yeah. Don't want to just read and go. <laughs> that's fair. Um, there's nothing worse, is there? No. You ever go to <laughs> don't ever do that, people. Um, right, so um, next up is me. Um, I, uh, I've published various places uh, around the world, but um, not with a collection of my own yet, although I am working on it. So, um, yeah, I've got a couple of VE Day poems and war poems and women poems. Um, yeah, so this is called Tuesday the 8th of May, 1945. We kiss and toast and fuck our way to life and hope after years of darkness and the death of fascism. We're fed that lie. We're buried in the pockmarked skin of Europe, seeded with bones, artillery shells, bitten by cannon, tongued by bayonet. Our arteries bleed families into Poland, feed furnaces with the lives of six million. We revel in the streets of London, climb Nelson's column, dance in the cold fountain in Trafalgar Square. Um, this is another uh, VA day poem, one that hasn't been uh, brutally torn apart by my poetry class, so let's see how it goes. <laughs> um, in Harrogate, the cenotaph reads, to all the men and women who have given their lives in the service of their country. That rarest phrase etched on white Portland stone to include the women so often forgotten. A nurse, a land army volunteer, a YMCA volunteer, a Queen Mary's Army Auxiliary Corps volunteer, a munitions worker, some auxiliary territorial service workers. War doesn't just take men too young from muddy trenches, from boats lost to mine and crashing waves. Behind the front lines, nightingales tend to angel-caressed, shell-shocked soldiers. In rough cotton, with back bent and aching, crop pickers feed a nation. In blitz-kissed London, the steel helmet of the ARP warden couldn't stop the bombs from dropping. Ceiling pipes testing damaged buildings sometimes cause the debris to slide. Dulce est decorum, dulce air decorum est. It is sweet and fitting only when we remember all the victims of war. Thanks. It's weird without clamps. <laughs> um, yeah, get used to it, I suppose. Um, so this is, um, this is a, a poem I wrote uh, when I was at university, uh, won, won, the, won some prize and I got to hang out with a really cool author that I like, so it was good. It's called Extraordinary Rendition. Peeling paint reveals Islamic verse in unknown humours. The dirty cell, ramshackle bed, filthy blanket. His wife at home in the dark, with tooth and tears the baby cries for an unacquainted father. She sighs. Question, question, question. Bright lights beam in tired eyes. The corridor screams in the twilight. The Inquisition continues. How had he got here? Black hood, American accents, intravenous silence take away all thoughts of freedom. With fingernails and teeth remove all signs of resistance. Guilt by association. He crumbles. Inshallah, what do you know? Nothing. Allahu Akbar. Is he? Where is he? This belief is killing him, softly, softly, hardly, hardly. Late night, early descent into the chamber of horrors. Doesn't look like one, does he? Cocorico, Cocorico, the tactic changes. The rain beats on the corrugated roof and he is elsewhere. Security, service interrupted. Freedom of the man in the street shattered. Prisoners cut up with shards for your health. Uh, this one is called Spirit. Um, so this one is uh, is about, historically, 
we often find that women are, have, to, have to be hidden. Um, so there were women pirates who would dress as men. There is a, a famous case in, in France where they, they kind of dug up um, the, the graveyard of an old monastery and found that there was actually you know, the, the bones of, of women there. Um, and there's a famous case of a Viking um, where there is great debate as to whether this woman was a, was a warrior or was she, um, yeah, whatever she was, we don't know. So I wrote this for those women. Your skull uncovered by the elated archeologist. With kiss of bristle, she wakes you up from a millennium under loam and clay. Your tongue still there, a wisp of red blonde hair, even your rough woolen shirt saved by the bog water, mud clinging time to your bones. You're buried with dragon head gold, they'll debate your name, argue that those daggers, that heavy shield, would have you sen, not dot you. You whisper through the years of your lover, a wild man who knew your secrets locked in his heart of fierce sea battles, voyages to far off places where men painted red traded fur and hide, meat for the voyage and sacrifice to a gear, one there like you, they called two spirit. Thank you. Uh, this is this is a new one. In fact, the next three are new ones uh, written for either my poetry class or for the recent National Poetry Writing Month. Um, so I'm sorry, a couple of them do mention Corona. These things happen. <laughs> this one's inheritance. I have been wondering what I have to leave my son. I can't leave a house, a garden in springtime. I can barely leave him a wardrobe, just piles of clothes, something for every occasion. I know he loves the sequins and rainbows, but forgive him, he's only four. I've gifted him my blue eyes, a curve of cheek and squiggly hair, passed down these generations of women. I can leave him this land, the dales of Yorkshire, the kiss of gorse on the moor. It's not mine, but it is the bones that run through us. I can leave him a turn of phrase, the catch tone shift in his voice just like mine. I can leave the memory of these shut-in days, such love and fever and football in the deserted sunlit park. Thank you. This one is called The Locked Box. Under the bed, hidden behind dust balls, lost clothes, sex toys. I keep my thoughts of you triple locked with box, bolt and bar. Time corrodes the padlock open. You escape, a naked runaway lonely child. Slip out into the darkness, shackles off and milk teeth bared. Your skinny lips pursed, painted peach. Black catsuit clings, crowing anti-slim, even after two teenage daughters. C-section scar covered by the zip. Your telephone voice, no Bradford E, higher and softer than the spite of spat commands admonishments. Catch throat sobs at night, another lost love. Your head looks tiny when you screech, pig eyes shrunk tight, a list of reasons why I'm a terrible daughter. You hold out your arms and cry. We haven't spoken in eight years. You've never met my child. I'm scared because of you. He'll need a box of his own. Thanks. And this is the last one that I'm going to read. Uh, I'm reading it specifically for a person who said they were going to be here who is not, so I'll have to send it to her after this is finished. Uh, and this is called Data Double. Your data double is made up of all the digital detritus you leave around the internet. The crumbs from your cookies, the footprints you leave on the algorithmic sound, added together into a whole other you. All ones and zeros and accumulated information about your weight, your shoe size, favourite colour and subversive kinks, your political persuasion and your relationship with your mother. Because I'm a poet, my data double has far more hobbies than me, taken from the things I've had to research. They probably look a little more psychopathic than me. It's a data string from my murder mystery period when I had to know the exact time it takes to dissolve a headless corpse in the bath. My data double also sits between genders because I buy men's clothes and women's clo clothes for myself in equal quantities. 
Their face is one you'd call handsome, I imagine. A lovely adjective for a bloke and a backhanded compliment for a lady. Escape, I whisper to them, trapped between boredom and madness in this coronavirus quarantine. They can go to the shops, wander around the shelves, touching everything with cold, ghostly fingers. Stand too close to the old people, who were standing too close to each other anyway, discussing how Michael is doing in the hospital, poor dear. Doubled, I can stay home and get fat, away from government five eyes and police checkpoints, gorged on sticky pink marshmallows and chocolate cake mix. Half to cook and half to eat now. Salmonella be damned. What do you want to do? We can go anywhere, my data doubles, says. But I know that is a lie. Well, I'm caught between homeschool and homeworking. My double swings in play parks spins on yellow roundabouts. They travel faster, further, scuttle down overgrown fairy roads to visit everywhere and elsewhere. They smoke opium in Victorian squats, laid on chaise long of tatty red velvet, draw into the lung until the eyes roll back in their heads. Taking eldritch tentacled lovers between the pages of a book backed in human skin leaving only subtle hints that senses will try and understand and fail. This is where I have been, they say, whether to inform or evoke envy, I'm not so sure. Thank you. All right, and that was me. Um, so next up, we are going to have Helen reading. Helen, if you want to introduce yourself, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, there. Am I okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, bloody thing. Uh, right. Um, I was kind of doing a mother and daughter theme just to begin with. Um, my daughter married a German guy two years ago, and so she's over in Germany at the moment, which for the first time ever is actually sort of celebrating VE Day, uh, well, Berlin anyway, and they, um, because it's in lockdown, part lockdown, um, and they sort of see it mainly as freedom from fascism, which, like you say, is a lie, it's always there, <laughs> a bit too close for comfort these days. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's um, so first of all, it's just a short poem called Mothers and Daughters. Memories forged in the melt of love, grafted onto us through toil and joy. Fights against each other, fights to save each other. Moments past you were too young to remember, moments future I may become too old to recall. In the sharing, our strength survives. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm missing her quite a bit at the moment. Um, because, um, you know, before all this and before Brexit and all that, it was, would have been quite easy. And I was getting to know my new German family quite well, but uh, things are different now. Anyway, this is when I wrote, at her, and I did at her wedding. Um, she liked a particular Adele song, um, and it has got some allusions to Germany, so it's called Pavements. You've made up your mind, don't need to think it over. If you're wrong, you are right. So yes, just keep on chasing pavements. Even if, even if they're not yellow brick roads, but hard stumbling cobbles, dead ends, killing life and time, finding right way through wrong. Even if the, lo the road less traveled or madding thoroughfare, secret shady ginnel, or kicking along route 66, even if, hidden mountain paths where no one sees you crawl and conquer. Even if racing tracks where you limp last to the line with no one left to cheer. Even if you silverstone to the finish victorious as you inevitably will in the end. An old English custom is to throw a shoe after the bride as she leaves down the road. So I shall throw one after you, even into 
to some black German forest, grimly dark. It shall be a fairy tale slipper, but far stronger than glass and brighter than ruby bright. Yet I shall keep the other, its twin kin, until we meet somewhere over the rainbow, when we'll put on one, clicking our mother heel, daughter heels together again to go no place like home. So that's for her, <laughs> though she's not tuning in. I just, anyway, um, she'll probably catch up with it later. Um, and this is just one I've, I've just written, I'm sorry, <laughs> fateful words. Uh, I'm in the Society of Authors and I attended a tea with Roger McGough yesterday. And it was great, it was all virtual. And I don't know why this inspired me, but this brings us back to this present time. <clears throat> this poem cannot exist. These words are too rampant. They lie here innocent, then pounce on any innocent reader. You perhaps, dare you read? Dare you take these words, my words, in so that they become not my words, but your words? They pass between us like a virus, refusing to self-isolate, unmasked, spreading their contagion of meaning. Worse still, sentiment. There is no vaccine. Read and you've caught it. Covid poetry lethal so, um yeah and to finish off um i'm in the uh, women's equality party so this is a feminist poem which i wrote and performed for their conference two years ago to a room of about 300 women so um i'll just have to bring this up it might be slightly dated but if you remember all the issues at that time about presidents clubs and I mean, they're still there, they're just in a different form. So I'm going to give this a go. This is called Dicks Off the Table. Equal representation will not be televised. It will not be globalised, Instagramized, Trumpingly Twitterized, Facebook or fake bookized. Nor have I got news for you, satirised. Equal representation will be intersectionalized, championized, achievementized, amazementized, jubilantized. Open up your eyes. We are here. Get used to it. We are here. You will get used to it. We are here. You are already used to it. We have always been here in your boardrooms, your conference suites even in your clubs. There in the background, tea ladies serving pastries and delicacies, your reluctant grope buddies, all in the name of charity and for your own very good cause. You know what I mean. But this time we are sitting down at the table with you from PLC boardroom to every public governing body. Don't worry, we will be gracious even do it traditionally, placing ourselves, boy, girl, boy, girl, equal. So dicks off the table, open up your magnanimous patriarchal arms real wide, but not to give us hugs or handshakes. We do business differently. We do politics differently. Instead, open them up to gather the rich wards of rewards of diversity, the sharing of our searing intellects and our toughness beyond brawn, born of insurmountable challenges, well and truly beaten. We are here and equal representation will not be televised. Thank you. Um, how do I get with this? There. <laughs> there. That's me, thank you. <laughs> There you go, I'm off mute. <laughs> thank you very much, Helen, and uh, particularly thank you for your rousing rendition of that, that last one. It was really, really good. Um, next up, uh, we have Lorna, whose surname I cannot remember. I'm really sorry, we've only just become Facebook friends. <laughs> um, but yeah. Don't, yeah, don't, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Feel free to introduce yourself. Um, and yeah, um, next up, we have Lorna. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, yeah, I'm Lorna Fair I've 
obviously just put my name as Lorna on here, but Lorna Fairdon is how I go by, um, kind of in poetry circles. Um, I am really pleased to be here because I am currently recovering from um, COVID-19. Um, I work in the NHS and I've been out of action for three weeks, um, but I am still positive, so I'm not allowed to leave the attic, so it's nice to, to come along. Um, I, like, Jill spoke about the um, Real Bradford anthology that we, we um, worked on together as a project um, with two other brilliant poets as well. And I am going to start off with um, one of my poems from this anthology. So it's, um, as Jill said, it's, it's in response to film and TV um, and media all set around Bradford. And we developed it in collaboration with um, the Bradford City of Film. Um, and my poem, this is a poem I wrote after watching the film Room at the Top which um, I hadn't seen before and I, and I watched as part of this project. Um, it's, it's a 1959 film, so just post-war, and apparently I had a very strong reaction to it. It's called A Feminist Millennial's Response to Joe. Your sense of entitlement makes me sick. Time and time again, people like you are given your fill with room and space to suffocate and command. You're not chill, you just, try, you just thrive on cheap thrills and status, screwing women over every time. I know in the 50s it was different, with chimes of the post-war freedom of second chances, you were a chancer tasting the fine glamour from across the class divide, an industrial Bradford pierced with chimneys, your dramatic backdrop, the most romantic part of your whole crappy story. You stun me into anger and wind me up to spluttering hate. I know you were scrambling to make your way and they'd hailed you as some kind of hero, but for me, you're forever a failure you fall so short. You try for anything you could and you give northerners a bad rep. It wasn't the sleeping around that got me. Or even your post-coital silence as Susan asked, wasn't it super, Joe? you are come fresh inside her and you disappointed by innocence. I just can't stand your swagger and stare. You're screaming to scare her, your don't care attitude to others. A God complex, keeping me waiting for you to bloody learn, to rectify your wrongs. And if you were here now, I'd probably troll you on every social media platform possible. Thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> bit of anger there. Oh, apologies to mum. <laughs> raising her eyebrows at that one. Um, I am also really lucky to be um, involved in um, Rhubarb, which is a spoken word night in Shipley. Um, and I yeah, helped help to organise that along with three brilliant poets. Um, and we have this anthology that came out a couple of years ago um, called Unforced, and it's a collection of poetry that, that kind of came just in a really unforced way, but also poetry that took a while to develop. So it's split into two sections. And this is a forced poem, so it's one that took a while to develop. And it's called Marion Wallace Dunlop, and she was a suffragette. And this is, this is her story, really. Did her heart feel the fluttering beat, like thrills of women through the street, as she graffitied in the House of Commons? Writing the law on the wall, her act of rebellion was seen as a crime and she was treated as felon. She didn't use violence or mobbing or weapons, just a statement that Parliament should make women welcome. Intelligent language laced for this cause, a great suffragist, a feminine force, such boldness, class and grace in the face of conceit. They treat her as a second class prisoner, not as political, just common criminal in Holloway prison. 
Whilst there she urged in ink that life is short, to choose your path and fight discord, or that you'll blink and that's the end, no future left then to defend. They hoped they'd forced her to defeat, end political protests in the street. She saw their plan, devised her own. In her cell she was alone, but in her action she then chose to feed her sisters, keep her own lips closed. Hunger strike, her one last chance to change their intolerant political stance. She took the challenge, her great insight, used all she had to win this fight. Her dress, her jewels, her petticoat, they would be violet, green and white. Till 1918, she held this hope that they'd agree to give women the vote. Um, okay, a, a similar theme again. Um, this poem's called The Glass Trap and it's kind of a, a modern perspective looking back and um, there is reference to um, kind of the, the, the role that women played in the war as well. So the glass trap. They would have preferred pure silence to be reverberating from polished glass and clean floors. Their preference for no questions to be asked as she dutifully shifted and paused to keep their distorted balance. They engineered the absence of confident, rebellious spirits, labelled them pause, then bottled, compartmentalised, placed aside, out of view or trouble. They constructed glass ceilings, a pacifying bubble, skillfully disguised with neatly presented perfect homes. Furnished with tradition and feathered with lies to distract ambitious eyes from asking for what was owed to them. They developed language with bias to emphasize that only quietness, shyness, the gentle and pious would make it to heaven. They would have no space for big hopes that didn't conform to their own narrowness. So took her dreams, applied pressure watched them buckle and lessen in passion, left reeling till her ambition was as transparent as that suffocating ceiling. They focused on keeping her firmly in the place history had carved out for her with masculine tools, chiseled, trapped, then bent her back to their own satisfaction. They overlooked her clever, convictions, how gentle, quiet and furious were not contradictions, but combined to form all potentials for love. They forgot about her strength. It bloomed with the wild poppies, bloody flowers flowing month on month renewed. They installed mirrors and cosmetic ideals, magnifying imperfections to perpetuate a deception of ugliness. They spent all their energy on the surface, but underestimated her ability to call out. An echoing outcry, shattering mirrors and glass constraints. Her beauty is in number, in nurturing, connecting and sharing, mother in nature. Um, I think I've got time for one more, haven't I? Um, I'm working on um, a Bronte collection at the moment. This isn't um, totally Bronte focused, but it's the start, I think, of my poem in that collection. And it's called The Inevitability of Difficult Paths. And, and I guess it's a, a reflection on loss, which is also apt for today. We avoid the awkward, sticky, confusing moments whenever we can. Avoid saying goodbye, hello, or sometimes how we really feel, as if it makes it easier in the end. We keep it clinical, cowardly. It is inevitable. And so what I wish for you is happy deaths at the right time. Witnessing their quiet, peaceful, dreaming, dreamy slipping into otherworldliness. Smiles before parting. Loose ends tied up, repairing ruptures, a soft rebalancing of conflict, 
I wish you understanding, that you could speak out your truth, all that you can, darkness cradled and light treasured in equal measures of fiery dust. I hope that your pain is bearable. Uh, how am I doing for time? Do you think that's good? I think that's, I think that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think Rachel's going to give some thanks and chat to us about some women on tap stuff. Yes, hello. Thank you so much, guys. That was really, really good. Some absolutely fantastic poems there. Um, do you guys, are you guys meet? I just saw a comment pop up in the chat about meeting remotely. Um, do you guys do any sort of um, regular meeting as a group at the moment? Um, not at the moment, but we're thinking about it this might be a start and <laughs> good point now I, I i take part in obviously so jill lambert does some uh, poetry classes if anybody fancies doing them they're very very good and relatively cheap um, i know they're looking at setting up a new one now so um if you do want that uh, tap up rachel and she'll drop me a message and i'll put you in contact um because yeah the classes are, are excellent so i wrote that um the first one i read the war poem um was a hodgepodge of nonsense this morning and then we <sighs> turned it into that which i think was great so that was excellent um i do take part there's there's a lot of online poetry stuff happening at the minute it's okay. actually amazing so you can take part in open mics in new york in israel in poland in like literally anywhere um okay. so yeah keep keep your eyes out really um because there's like stuff like this happening all the time and i know we've all kind of done well certainly i have been to dj sets and gigs and but poetry readings i think it works really well in this format because of the intimacy and you're at home and i really like it oh come on then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i think if there's anything in particular gem that you can think of that might be useful just share it in on the facebook event or something yeah uh, just if it's you know anything specific otherwise people can probably figure out how to get in touch with one of us and we'll point yeah. it in direct. I'm easy to find. Yeah. I'm mouthing off on most places on the internet, all the social media, all the usual social media places. Yeah. 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 No, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who joined us. I know some have had to jump off, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but we're still, yeah, still got a good, good few on. So uh, thanks very much for being with us on this sunny bank holiday Friday afternoon. And uh, get well soon, Lorna. Crikey. Yeah. Sounds like you've been through the mill. Um, wishing you a very speedy recovery from here. Um, Thank and you. That's, yeah, no worries, no worries. Seeing you there in your attic, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, join in some more Women on Tap stuff if you fancy it, because we're doing stuff till Sunday, so there might be some talks and things that might keep you distracted for the rest of the weekend. Um, and that goes for everyone, really. If there's anything else that you fancy on the website, uh, womenontap.co.uk, uh, everything's free to register for. Uh, we've got a talk this afternoon, a VE Day talk at four o'clock, um, which looks like it's going to be a good one. So um, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, thanks, Gem, and thanks to everyone who's read uh something today um and i hope to see you all soon thank you very much thanks very I'm much keep in touch please with all your whatever you're doing <laughs> thanks. thanks guys bye bye